Stay hungry, stay foolish. In Rebel Talent, today's guest shows us why the happiest and most successful among us are those who break the rules and how we can all do it more. The world's best chef, the pilot who landed his plane on a river, the magician who made history, the computer scientist who changed animated films forever. What do they all have in common? They are all rebels. Our guest has been studying rebellion and conformity for more than 15 years. She has discovered that when we mindlessly follow rules and norms rather than constructively rebelling against them, we become less happy and less successful in every area of our lives. While rebels may seem disruptive, they are ultimately good for business. Their passion, drive, curiosity, and creativity can raise organizations to a whole new level. When we break the rules, we fix our lives. We welcome award-winning Harvard Business School professor, behavioral scientist, and author of Rebel Talent, Why It Pays to Break the Rules at Work and in Life, Francesca Gino. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you on the show. I thought, Francesca, we would open with the story of a fellow Italian master, Chef Massimo Bottoro, a true rebel. I have a very vivid memory of where and when I learned about him. And I was so surprised that I felt compelled to tell this story. I was walking through um, a local bookstore and I was browsing the shelves and I saw a book that was larger than usual with a cover Merlot in color. And the title of it was Never Trust a Skinny Italian Chef. And being Italian, I was intrigued. So I started flipping through the pages and it became clear to me that this was not your typical recipe book. There were pictures of beautiful dishes, uh, dishes like the crunchy part of the lasagna. And just from the picture, uh, you sort of started asking yourself, how could you resist to that? But they didn't resemble any of the traditional meals I had grown up with. And the book told the story of Chef Massimo Bottura, uh, a master of traditional recipes whose talent led him to come up with a different way of looking at traditional dishes. He basically went to traditional dishes, Italian traditional dishes, and started asking questions. Why is it that we cook the dish this way? And then he came up with rather innovative way of cooking the same dish. His restaurant is now a three Michelin star restaurant, and is also a restaurant that in 2018 became the best restaurant in the world. And so they were also at the top of the list in 2016. And it's a great story because when I think about contexts where it's clear that we cherish our old traditions, definitely traditional Italian cooking would be one of them. And also, as you might know, there are lots of rules when it comes to Italian cooking. And so here you had a person who had the courage to study those traditions, but also ask a lot of questions and reinvent them. I loved his answer when you asked him who inspired him and he named Chinese conceptual artist Ai Weiwei. I think that's the right pronunciation. Yeah. He said here, the destructive gesture was actually a constructive one. It'd be lovely to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, what I love about what he said in terms of looking at this person who inspired him. So what you would see in this piece of art is the artist basically dropping a vase that is 2000 year old. And so at first you might look at it and be puzzled. Why is it that we sort of are breaking something that we have been treasuring for years. But the deeper message there is that it's important for us to respect traditions, but it's also important for us to break away from them, if in fact it makes sense to break away from them. And one of the things and the interesting parallels that I see in a lot of organizations is that we often take existing processes or procedures or system or just ways of working for granted. It is almost as if we get into this routine of accepting things as they are and stopping asking questions of whether there are ways of working or ways of coming up with a new procedures that would be even better. So I think that that's the deeper message of that 
piece of art, or at least that's the message that Bottura took away from it. As you say, most businesses are all about following the rules, not breaking them. And people who question their own assumptions and strongest beliefs, as well as the widely accepted norms around them to identify more creative, effective ways of transcending work, people who are deviants, but in a positive and constructive way. But as you say, rebels are only grudgingly tolerated. And if they become too annoying, they were shown the door. This happened to me myself. I mentioned to you before. I worked in a public <laughs> broadcaster as a head of innovation. And you step on so many toes in a positive way. And you're trying to guide people to a different way. But oftentimes, as I mentioned, you're shown the door. And this is very, very common. You experience this a lot in your work. Absolutely. And part of the motivation behind the bot and wanting to put these ideas out there is to suggest that we think about rebels the wrong way. The book is really about rule breaking as a constructive rather than a destructive force. And I wanted to focus on those rebels in the business and in life more generally who challenge the status quo in ways that really drive positive change. They're the ones who are able to adapt to new situations, to the world that seems to be so uncertain, and they're able to stay persistent in the face of challenges. And so I wanted to try to explore what it is that makes them effective at what they do in a way that could inspire others, me included, <laughs> to be more of a rebel more often. And you identify five core elements, Francesco, of rebel talent. It'd be great to share them with our audience. In my work, I identify these five talents. And part of the reason why I love the label rebelliousness or being a rebel talent is that these are talents that, despite the fact that we all have them, they don't come naturally to us. Our human nature is coming in the way we need to fight against it. We need to rebel against it. The first talent is what I call a talent of for novelty. So most of us love the predictable or what's comfortable and what's best for us when we think about how we approach life and work and all the good stuff that comes out of it, including being more innovative, is um, going for what's uncomfortable and novel and new instead. So that's the talent for novelty. The second one is the talent for curiosity. Most of us get into situations where we approach life and work by following uh, existing procedures and processes and tradition and taking them for granted. And instead, the rebels are people who ask a lot of questions. They approach the world with the same type of curiosity that we all used to have when we were little kids. The third one is a talent for perspective. Again, because of our human nature, we tend to come to the world and come to work and to problems with one view. It's usually our own perspective. And instead, the rebels have this ability of looking at problems from all sorts of angles and uh, perspectives. Then there is a talent for diversity. Society often um, pushes upon us social roles or biases or stereotypes and rebels fight against that. So they're more aware of what these biases are and they're better able to leverage differences uh, between themselves and others. And finally, there is a talent for authenticity. So again, most of us often decide to just go along with what others are doing or saying, or uh, in a meeting, we keep our ideas to ourselves because everybody else is, seems to be agreeing on a different idea. And instead, rebels are people who bring out their authenticity. They are not afraid of expressing their views and contributions. So, so these are the five talents that I have identified in my work. I'd love to get into each of those talents and just touch on some of the many, many case studies and storytelling that you have around them. But at the very start of the book, you celebrate Napoleon. And I thought this was great because history's view of Napoleon is this kind of egocentric leader. But you say actually the opposite is true. And he was extremely well prepared he led through innovation in a way, and he was responsible for so many social and beneficial changes in our world. 
Absolutely. And if you talk to historians who spent almost uh, decades in their life study him, what you will learn, as I did, is that despite the fact that there are lots of superficial stories about him, as you said, he was not only a great leader in terms of driving innovations, but he was also a leader who was able to put himself in the trenches. So rather than just giving his directions or uh, guiding people from uh, far away from the field, he was in the trenches with these people. And this is something that I've saw, I've seen in rebel leaders do a lot of. So for example, when I think about Massimo Vutura, some of the uh, images of this chef and stories of this chef that really surprised me in terms of how he leads his team are scenes like him arriving in the morning to the restaurant. And one of the first things that he does is putting his chef coat on and then going outside with a broom and start cleaning the streets. And it is almost as if there are not tasks that are beneath him even if that's often what we expect of leaders, that they sit in their offices and they tell us what to do, they give us orders and we follow them. And so what was beautiful is that rebel leaders are often with their people and that is an important aspect of how they drive this commitment to viewing the world differently, to wanting to have that courage uh, to come up with innovative ideas rather than sticking with the status quo. Let's jump to the case study, your own case study of the Morningstar, the largest tomato processing company in the world, and also the short free association exercise that you run it with your executives to hear what they think of the term rule breaking itself. Absolutely. I often do this exercise with executives and with leaders across many different industries to just try to understand what comes to mind when they think about rule breaking. And a lot of the words that they quickly come up with are words that are negative, that are related to problems that you might run run into if you actually allow people to break rules. So, So things like illegal, or things like unethical or thinking like uh, pushing the boundaries, but with a negative uh, meaning. And it takes them a while to also realize that rule breaking could actually be positive for the business. And so come up with words like innovations or ideas or being courageous. And what I love about the exercise is that right up front, it puts on the board or it puts in the conversation the idea that often we look at rebelliousness and rule breaking as negative. And so it opens up an interesting conversation of why is that the case? But more interestingly, at least from my perspective, why is it that this could in fact turn into a positive force? And so a lot of the case studies that I bring to the classroom or I bring to leader and executives in corporate training are case studies of organizations that are doing things a little bit differently. Uh, organizations that are really embracing the idea of rebelliousness. And one of them is Morningstar. Morningstar decided to go a little bit extreme in the sense of saying, you know what, maybe hierarchy creates problems and people really need to have a say and more autonomy in what they do. And so they're very much structured on uh, self-management. And so if you come in, you have to decide your own mission. What's nice is that the mission is uh, supposed to be aligned with the goals and values of the organizations, and the mission also get negotiated with your peers. So from the start, they're creating a system where people come in They have the chance to express who they are, stay authentic, do their work with a great sense of ownership, but also they're not going off the rails because there are these mechanisms, like the fact that you're negotiating your mission with others or the fact that you're staying aligned with organizations that really allow for this type of rebelliousness to be constructive. That's often where leaders struggle How is it that I can assure I bring in rebelliousness, but at the same time, works get done and the organization stay productive? 
You mentioned also Zuckerberg, Gates and Jobs in the same paragraph. You mentioned how they dressed against the norm. This one is fascinating because you did this brilliant study in the fashion centers of Rome where you measured the potential customer's perceived status. And this is really interesting for people who feel they need to dress with the flow, but actually the opposite is true. What we wanted to show in this research is that when we are intentionally breaking the norm, and in this case, we were looking at appearance in the sense of how you dress, we often believe that others are going to view us negatively, and it's just the opposite. Others sort of look at us and respect us more. They think that we have greater influence, greater power, greater status, exactly because we had the courage to break the rules. So it was interesting to sort of show this paradoxical finding and results where our mind will lead us to do X, but in fact, if we are to um, dress down in this case, others are going to appreciate what we're doing more and think of us more highly. So one way I tested out these ideas was right in the classroom. So in um, one of my teaching opportunities, I had the chance to teach the same class to two different groups, same type of organization, back to back. So the content was the same. What I was going to do was also the same. But what I decided to do in between classes is change my shoes. So I went from a suit and a nicely, uh, really kind of formal pair of shoes to same suit, but I was teaching in red sneakers. And at the end of class, I gave people a survey, both classes, asking questions around how much influence and status they thought I had at HBS or how much they thought I charged for my consulting. And what was interesting is that I found that the perception of my student changed depending on my dress. So in the class where I was wearing a suit but red sneakers, I gained more status and influence in their eyes as compared to the other class. And this just confirmed what our studies had shown that despite the fact that we might think the opposite when we break uh, and go against these type of conventions, people actually respect us more and give us more status. I'm going to jump around a little bit now, Francesca, because I'm going to jump forward when you talk about diversity and some of your own experiences. And you mentioned dress here when you were eight months pregnant, teaching to a class of executives and also where you wore more tightly fitting dresses. I think it's really important because we also mentioned the perception that a word like rebellion or rule breaking can have on people's minds. But you also mentioned when you talk about diversity, job specs, for example, peppered with male dominated language actually has an effect on how many female applicants there will be. I think this is a really important topic that often gets overlooked. Yeah, there are all sorts of biases that are often unconscious that we carry with us. And one of the things that we need to know that rebels do actually quite naturally is recognize that we're humans and we do have these biases. But what I had experienced in some of my work and I've seen rebels do is that they don't let the existence of these stereotypical views freeze them to the point that they make them anxious when they are interacting with others or they make them perform less well on the job. And so what has been interesting from my perspective in looking at the research and experiencing it myself, uh, often being in front of executives where the class is primarily of white male, is not to think about the fact that they're going to judge me negatively just because I don't belong to their group, if you will, but that, that there is an opportunity for me not only to do well, but also to learn from them. And it's a very small shift in mindset. But when we're thinking of approaching situations that might be stressful as an opportunity to learn, and we sort of tell ourselves, let's get excited, that's actually much better than 
telling ourselves that this is in fact is going to be stressful and then feel the anxiety that comes from that experience. You talk about stereotypes in your classroom and you give your students a little test. It'd be great to mention that to their audience and maybe throw that test out in the airwaves. Yeah, whenever I talk about biases and so unconscious bias and stereotypical views are clearly part of this category, students sort of look at it and say, yeah, 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 I can think of lots of examples where my colleagues really made poor decisions because of these biases. And it's harder to look at ourselves and say, well, as it turns out, we are as humans as our colleagues and like them, we are affected by these biases. And so often when I talk about diversity, inclusion, unconscious bias, I bring simple exercises like the exercise that you were mentioning. So imagine being in the class, often our classes are actually quite large, so a group um, of 80, 90 people. And the exercise is gonna be one where I'm going to show them white screen and tell them that what I'm interested in is seeing how fast they are in putting words that they're going to appear on the screen, putting them into categories. And there are two categories. The name of the first category appears on the top left of the screen and the name of the second one appears on the top right. And what's interesting is that people love games. So they're sort of excited to show that they can do this fast, that they can learn from round to round. And at the beginning, the game starts simple. So you would see, for instance, a first name. And so you need to tell me whether it belongs to the category male because it's a male first name or the category female. And what everybody's doing in the classroom as I'm showing them these words quickly that are appearing uh, in the middle of the screen is something like left, right, left, right. So there is this beautiful choir where everybody is talking um, and going through this game together. And then Round by round, I make it a little bit more complex on them. So I talk about double categories. So for instance, you would see a word again that pops in the middle of the screen. And the word is again, either a first name or a word that is associated either to home or to career. And the first time you do this complex round, if you will, the category is Uh, on the top left of the screen are related to male and career, and the one on the other side of the screen are female name or home. And so people generally do that fast. But when you reverse it for them, such that on the top left you have male home, and on the top right you have a female and career, they struggle through it. All of a sudden, they make mistakes in the way they associate the words appearing in the, pop, in the middle of the screen to this category. Uh, they start laughing. And what they realize right there in the classroom is that we have these biases that somehow uh, associating male with career and female with home comes more easily to us than doing the opposite, associating female and career and male with home. And it's a beautiful exercise. It's called, it's a version of the implicit association test. It's a beautiful exercise because right there in the moment, evidence right in front of your eyes tells you that this is a bias that you carry. And so it allows for a very honest and open discussions about when is this a problem and what it is that we can do about it and what it is that they've seen rebels do naturally to address these type of biases. Yeah, and I love what you say, and I quote you from the book here. You say, our examples and stories can change how others think often in powerful ways. And you're doing this as well, which is why I love having you on the show the more people we can share these thoughts with, we can actually change how people think. You talked about diversity, not just in the sense of male, female, which often where it stops, but you talk about diversity in a wider scope, that it's positive for financial and economic stability, but also empowers innovation and the avoidance of groupthink. It'd be great to share some of your thoughts on this. There is a lot of research that shows that 
diversity can really make life better at work in terms of the quality of decision, in terms of our ability to come up with innovative ideas, in terms of productivity. But the part that is less talked about, which in a sense is an uncomfortable truth, is that diversity needs to be managed and leveraged. So one of the interesting things that I see in a lot of organizations is that People understand the value of diversity. There is enough now out there uh, to be convinced that diversity is good. But then you just raise the level of diversity and you think that your job is done. And that is not the case. I often tell uh, leaders I meet or employees that I meet that diversity is an acquired preference. And at first I get this strange look (laughs) from people who say, what do you mean by that? And what I mean by that is that as we increase diversity in a group, in an organization, we are basically committing, if we want that diversity to be beneficial, we're committing to a world where we are okay to feel and be challenged by others, that we are okay to be open to the ideas of others. Again, that doesn't come naturally to us. I don't know about you, but I generally like when people nod their heads and they agree with what I'm saying rather than people who ask the tough questions. And so diversity needs to be leveraged. I also wanted to suggest, as other scholars have done, that often we think of diversity the wrong way. Even the language that we use isn't quite right. So traditionally, often, especially in organizations that want to bring in more diversity, it's talked about as a problem to solve. What rebellious organizations instead do, or rebel leaders, they talk about it as an opportunity to leverage. So they talk about the importance to really leverage differences. That, to me, opens up a whole different conversation that is much more positive in tone and nature as compared to the traditional way of looking at this. And to bring it beyond business, because we often talk about sports and the lessons from sports on this show as well, you cover how diversity in sport and actually lead to better results. Absolutely. The interesting aspect of diversity, or one of them, is that it really affects every sphere of life. And so if we're in fact able to be in situations and put ourselves in situations where there is more diversity in perspective, in the ways of thinking, in the way of approaching work, we're going to experience the benefit. And that often is as simple as having this moment of reflection with ourselves and say, well, when I think about the people I interact with at work or in my personal life or the people I tend to go to when I need some advice or I want to brainstorm ideas, who are those people? At a fundamental level, are they people who are very similar to me in my way of thinking or they're actually different? And I went through this exercise myself a few years ago and I was surprised. I had a lot of people who were quite similar to me. And so I started reaching out and adding people to my network who I know would increase the level of diversity, but in a way that would create better decisions, more innovative ideas, and in a sense, allow me to engage with life and work uh, much more fully. And it's interesting that when I think about diversity, one of the organizations that comes to mind, which I think was remarkable on this dimension, is uh, maybe an organization a bit out of the left field, is pirate ships in the 16th century. What was fascinating about them is two things. One is that at a time When it was about 200 years before slavery ended in the United States, they were the most diverse organization on the planet. And it's because they were hiring people for their crews based on skills and commitment and ideas rather than focusing on gender or skin color. So just for that, I think they were an incredible organization. And then they were uh, organized in an interesting way, uh, which made me think quite a bit. Uh, about my own life and my own work. The crew was in charge of choosing the captain and the crew could actually remove the captain if the captain was not behaving well (laughs) towards the crew. And to me, that's wonderful because it raises the question of all of us asking ourselves, 
whether we are the type of captain that our crew we choose as his leader on a day-to-day basis. And I think it's a very humbling question to ask. It really is. And there's so many actual questions you raise here, which is so good for our thought process as well. But I'm going to tee up the next topic with a quote from Raymond Chandler that you quote in the book. The first kiss is magic. The second is intimate. The third is routine. And you use this quote to introduce the need for novelty in our relationships, but also in our businesses and lives. What is interesting is that most of us, again, because of our human nature, go with what's comfortable and familiar. And what we should be doing instead, if we really want to retain this creativity, the innovative juices that we all have in ourselves, is to expose ourselves to novel activities or novel situations more often. That's what the talent for novelty that rebels have is all about. And in the book, I talk about a personal experience. I talk about how a few years ago, it was Christmas time, and I had what I thought was the perfect gift for my husband. My husband is a geek, so he always loves the latest piece of technology as a present or the latest gadget. And on Christmas Day, he was super excited. He went downstairs. He found his uh, big present, and when he opened it, He didn't find a gadget. He found a card that let him know that I had signed us up for a 10-week course, two hours a week in improv comedy. And my husband was totally confused by the present. Not that happy, I have to say, when he opened it. But what was interesting is that his attitude started to change as we went from one class to another. Improv was all about every week stretching ourselves, doing things that were new and novel. And week after week, he became excited to have this weekly date with the unexpected. And what was really fascinating is seeing what research has been telling us about for quite some time, that when we do things that are novel, rather than doing things that we're just comfortable with, we experience work and life differently. We get more pleasure out of it. We're more engaged. And with that also comes the ability to uh, be able to come up with new ideas and to be more creative. You talk about rituals and tradition. And to highlight this, you say, in the grip of tradition, we miss out on novelty and therefore the excitement of working without a script. Boredom or sometimes worse, any kind of mindless complacency can creep up on us. And the rebel is always trying new things. Let's share some of the studies on the unhelpful rituals that some people fall into. And you start here and you talk about children and the dinosaur Mm -hmm. test. It is uh, fascinating to me to see how often from the time we're small and then it gets worse uh, in many situations when we get to work, we just tend to imitate what others are doing. So some of the studies that have been done with children show that children over-imitate. What that means is that they see a person complete a series of steps as they're trying to achieve a certain goal. So, for example, uh, getting a toy out of a box or um, making sure that they solve a puzzle effectively. And what these studies have compared is situations in which you follow a series of steps that actually make sense to uh, situations where you follow steps um, that some of which just are not necessary. They could be skipped for efficiency or for other reasons. It would just be better if you didn't follow everything. And even when these steps are clearly unnecessary or even borderline ridiculous, what this study shows is that children still follow them. So it's like following a script. And you might think, well, children are children, and maybe they don't realize that the steps are as ridiculous as they look to adults. But in reality, you can find the same results when the studies are done on adults. And so we have this tendency to come into situation and just follow what others are doing. We don't ask curious questions about whether there is something that we could be doing differently in a way that makes the process better or makes 
us being able to achieve the task with more creativity uh, or by being more innovative. So quite surprising as a set of results. And you did your own studies as well on t-shirt folding, etc. And you, you say novelty is a stimulant and it can lead to what psychologists call self-expansion. But you bring a business example to the fore here and you talk about PAL's sudden service. I thought this was an interesting one where people might be able to action some of these things. What was intriguing to me in exploring what the talent of novelty does for rebels is that I could imagine a skeptic looking at it and say, yeah, 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 I understand that. I understand the importance of injecting novelty into our life, into the work that we do. But in the end, we got to be productive. We need to be efficient in the ways of working. And I was out on a mission of trying to understand how organizations and contexts that are really about executing to excellence actually do think about the importance of novelty. And so Pile's Sudden Service was a perfect example. Pile's is a chain of fast food um, restaurant. So it is an organization that has stores in Tennessee and West Virginia. And what was interesting in learning about Pile's is that they're actually quite good at what they do. If you pick any measure of performance, revenue per square, you name it, they beat the competition by far. And we're talking about big brands like McDonald's, Burger Kings, and Wendy's. Now, they don't have thousands of stores. They have dozens of stores, but still quite effective with what they do. And they're also true to their name. So their service is fast. In fact, just as a comparison, if it takes a competitor minutes to fill an order, it takes PAL 18 seconds. If you have something like an error every dozens of orders at a competitor, at PALS, you have an error every 3,600 orders. So they're really executing on excellence and they're doing so without errors. And they prepare people differently. Again, as an interesting comparison, if at a place like McDonald's, people receive an hour and a half, two hours of training per station, At PALS, workers receive 135 hours of training per station. So they're really expert in what they do, which allows them to perform their tasks on the job quite rapidly. And in fact, they spend quite a bit of time in their stores during rush hours. You see people working almost like robots as they're preparing the orders. And in a context like this one, you may say, okay, the work for them becomes monotonous or it becomes even boring. And the general managers have thought about that. So so there are small ways that they use to inject novelty, even in a context that might look as scripted as this one. So for instance, workers move from station to station, but they actually learn about the order that they're gonna follow in moving from station to station when they show up for work in the morning. So it's a very simple way to introduce a little bit of unpredictability, a little bit of novelty in the work that people do. And my conclusion then was, if we can see this and think about the importance of novelty in a context like Paul's that is really all about efficiency, then I think it has to be true and it could in fact be applied as an idea everywhere else. I love that. And we might move on to curiosity. I pulled a beautiful line about childhood and how we suppress curiosity in children. I think it's important for those who are around children as coaches, mentors, uncles, aunties, or parents to understand this. You say children absorb information like sponges and they learn at a rapid pace, but as they grow, they become more aware of how others, adults in particular, see them and they begin to rein in that curiosity. And curiosity, as research shows, typically peaks around four and five. And with age, self-consciousness increases, and so does our desire to make a show of expertise. But as you say, rebels learn to hold on to this childlike curiosity, and they never stop asking why. I love that. And it's a great way to introduce this topic of curiosity. Yeah, it's a striking to look at the data on curiosity. And it's something that shows you that this wonderful way of approaching 
life with a curious mind, with this sense of awe, is something that peaks at the age of four and five and then declines steadily from there. And I thought, when I looked at the data, first I thought it was kind of sad, but then I thought, well, it, it can't be true that we go about life this way in the years that follow our childhood. And I actually ended up collecting data on this. And what I found, it was basically that I was wrong. I thought that when people start new jobs, that's when curiosity pops back up. And so I collected data on hundreds of people across organizations across the globe. And what I found is that at first, curiosity is generally pretty high. But when you go back to the same people eight to nine months later, curiosity had dropped by at least 20% across the board. That's surprising, but it's also a missed opportunity because when we retain our curiosity, we're able to be more innovative in what we do. We make better decisions. We have better interactions with others. And so I was very interested in trying to understand what it is that people could do to be more like rebel to be curious, to keep on asking the why and what if type of questions. And the solutions that we can all use in our lives are actually pretty simple. One that I love is the idea of not only having performance goals that we want to achieve, maybe at work, but also in our personal lives, we can add learning goals. And when we do so, we are able to stay more curious. And even more simply, we can get into the habit of sort of looking at the world and remind ourselves of the importance of asking why and what if, as we were doing when we were little children. We tend to go through life, accumulate a lot of experience and expertise, and often we use that as a signal that we know it all, that we have all the answers. And rebels are people who remind themselves that the more experience and expertise they gain, the more it's left to learn. And so they have that beautiful sense of intellectual humility, if you will, that allows them to stay curious and to have that thirst for learning. And I think it's really important what you said about childhood as well. And you give a great story about your personal story about Greg, Alex and the pink milk and our reactions as parents or mentors or anybody who's around children or even around your people, if you're a leader, your reactions to their questions or how you physically appear that you're inviting that curiosity in rather than blocking it back. And we tend to block it more and more as we get older. Exactly. I have changed my reactions to situations where others are showing their curiosity. And this is true with my own children. Uh, but it's also true with colleagues at work in situations where they're bringing up new ideas or in situations where they're asking questions. Rather than just giving answers, I ask questions back in a way that allows us for the opportunity to explore more and, and stay curious. And there are so many opportunities around us that allow for that curiosity to pop out. There is a beautiful story that comes from the restaurant. And this is a story of a very busy night. And one of the sous chefs who's Japanese, his name is Taka, was working on the last dessert of the night. And it was a lemon tart. And Taka is known in the restaurant for being obsessed with details. He's really good at... Uh, attention to details that is required to arranging all sorts of plates that and dishes that are made there. And as Taka was working on the tart and arranging all the different pieces on the plate, the plate dropped to the floor. And now you had a smashed tart. And Taka was almost starting to panic since he made a mistake. And as he was experiencing this feeling, Chef Massimo Batura walked into the kitchen and saw the plate. And many other restaurants, especially fancy restaurants, People in Butura's shoes would have started yelling. And in fact, I visited many of them over the years, I should say for research purposes, and that's what you usually see. But Butura didn't do that. And not only that, he looked at the plate and then he looked at Taka and he said, Taka, I think we have a new idea for a new dessert. And sure enough, they came up with a new dessert that is a deconstructed lemon tart. And if you were to look at the picture of the dish, it's almost as if um, you're smashing a tart on the plate. And the name for it on the menu is, oops, I dropped the lemon tart. 
is the most popular dessert at the restaurant today. And it's a beautiful example of a leader who takes on every opportunity to approach situations, potential problems, what might look like mistakes with this curiosity that allows him to come up with all sorts of new ideas and solutions. Even in the case of accident, is the one who is finding a source of inspirations. There's a great message, an opportunity for all of us to feel inspired, but find similar opportunities in the work that we do. We are often the one who believe, for example, in relationship to curiosity, that if we allow ourselves or if we allow others to experiment, they might fail, but also we might end up in chaos. And that is not the case. As long as the experimentation is disciplined and it comes from good intentions, there is a lot that can be learned and a lot that we can all benefit from uh, by just exploring and staying curious. And as we do so, we are also modeling the behavior from, for others in a way that can be quite contagious. When you talk about modeling behaviors and actually leading from the front, you talked about the great case of a fellow countryman, Adriano Olivetti, and you compare his balance between exploration and exploitation versus Henry Ford's methods of pure efficiency, for example. Is an example that it's an old one, but it's actually one of my favorite because here you had a leader who became to be the CEO of the company. And he did so after spending some time working on the manufacturing floor. And what he discovered is that he had an opportunity to make life better for his workers in very simple ways. And he was always interested in expanding their views. So the fact that he created the library, the fact that he extended lunch from one hour to two hours, and the first one is to eat lunch, the second one is to eat culture. In the second hour, he had novelists, poets, musicians come to the firm and just talk about their ideas or play their music in a way that expanded people's interest. That's a wonderful way of keeping people curious, broadening their interests. He's also a person who clearly modeled the behavior for others. There is a beautiful story that I tell in the book that stood out to me in terms of some of his time as a leader at the company where some of the workers saw a peer leave at the end of the day with a bag full of parts. So the parts that they were used in the factory to make the products. And they started calling him a thief. And they went to the CEO and said, look, we have a thief. This is a person who's stealing from the firm. You need to fire him. And again, some leaders might have reacted by actually finding the person, but Adriano Olivetti showed curiosity and say, I wonder. And that led him to meet with the person, discovering that uh, he was actually taking parts home because he was experimenting and trying to build a new product. And he left the meeting by putting him in charge as the head of production of a new process that would actually try to build the machine that he himself was trying to experiment with. And it turned out to be one of the most uh, remarkable products in terms of margin and profitability that Olivetti put out on the market. And so again, it's a great example of the benefits that can occur if we actually approach work and life with a little bit more curiosity. I love one of the topics you introduced to avoid groupthink, where you talk about counterfactual thinking. Here you inform us part of the reason we fall out of love with work and life is the common tendency to neglect information that contradicts our views or preferences and to instead focus on data that confirms them. And the reason I mention this is in a world of so many algorithms and giving us more of what we read already or what we're already into and so much polarization that it's really important to get the other view. And you talk about this idea of counterfactual thinking, which is a great way to actually operate. It's easy for all of us to go through life and go through our work by just paying attention to information that tells us that we're right. It's a natural tendency. We all have it. But rebels break out of it by always asking the what if, thinking through in which ways I could be wrong. 
And that allows them to consider data that actually gives them a better picture of the situation, of the problem that they are trying to address, as well as having a more balanced view of that situation. So absolutely, counterfactual thinking is something that helps us there and is getting into the habit of asking the question of what kind of data speaks to the fact that this might in fact not be a good decision, rather than just asking ourselves the question of what kind of data suggested them right. I think it's important to mention authenticity because many, many people go through work wearing a mask and it must be so taxing to be inauthentic. And you talk about how this actually has a massive effect on people's morale and an impact on their sense of self. And you say in the book, we all hesitate before making ourselves vulnerable, fearful of being judged by others, but these worries are usually misplaced. And I love the study you shared by psychologist Elliot Aronson and what he calls the Prattfall effect. There are so many situations where we want to hide our mistakes. And that's what some of the research that Aronson and colleagues have done actually showed that when we're in situations where we could tell others about our limitations or disclose them, we don't do that. We prefer to show others that we're perfect and that we have no failures in our past and we have no limitations. When in fact, when we do share potential limitations or things that are not perfect about ourselves or we share our failures, others give us more respect. They have an easier time actually connecting with us because we are showing that, like them, we are human beings. And so it's a beautiful set of studies that hopefully gives us confidence next time around of not being so afraid of showing others our limitations, our potential mistakes in a way that, yes, makes us vulnerable, but that doesn't backfire. If anything, as I said, it creates better relationship that we're going to have with these other people because they're going to connect with us much more easily. You go much deeper into the importance of being ourselves. You cover storytelling and engagement and the eight principles of being a rebel leader. I'd love to cover all them, but we won't have time today. But a great way, I thought, to finish the show, as you do in the epilogue for the book, is a call to action to embrace the rebel inside. There are lots of things that I'm hoping we're all going to do more of, and they come down to really starting and being on this journey of being a rebel more often. And what I decided to do to help people, hopefully, to join me on this journey is uh, I created a test that that is available online at rebeltalents.org. And it's just a few questions, but if people answer the question, they're going to learn which type of rebel they are. And they're going to receive some feedback that tells them where to keep their attentions going forward. Where are some of the opportunities to bring out some of the talents that maybe don't come naturally to them more often in their life and at work? So I'm hoping that people are going to take the opportunity not only to read the book, but also to take the test and then, like me, decide to bring more rebelliousness in their life in a way that I think uh, is also going to bring much more satisfaction and joy. And just one last word is you do studied on this. You've, You've studied this and you've seen that actually, if you do take on some of these traits of rebels, you actually have a more successful career. You mentioned you're better at networking, better at connecting with people, etc. It might be worthwhile just mentioning that briefly. Absolutely. So it's not about just the personal satisfaction and happiness, but that I would say is important, is about engaging with life and with others differently. We're going to be present more fully. We are going to experience ourselves having greater levels of performance at work, being more innovative, being creative, but also having better relationship with others. So I think it's quite a long list of benefits. It does take a little bit of courage to be a rebel. It requires us to fight against natural tendency that we have as human beings. But the benefit is so large that I'm hoping people are going to feel compelled, as I felt when learning about this effective rebel, to follow suit. 
you mentioned there rebeltalent.org, but where else can people find out more about your work, your studies, your books, etc.? I have also created a website that is called francescagino.com, so hopefully easy to remember. And that has linked to the book's website and lots of resources that I'm trying to put out there for people to keep on embracing rebelliousness. Author of Rebel Talent, Why It Pays to Break the Rules at Work and in Life, Francesca Gino, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun to be talking to you. 